Shelby Price, and welcome to my workshop. I'm just back from the woodworking store. Got a couple of router bits, but I don't have a router table. I think it's time to remedy that situation. Come on inside, let me show you what I got in mind. Let's build a new router table. Part one, a rolling foundation. This is my rolling base. I have the cast iron on top to make sure that when it's in the stable position, the wheels retract. Now, there's a foot lever up front that when I press down and engage it, the wheels go down and the whole cabinet lifts up, allowing me to move it where I want. Now, I've got a rotating wheel up front and I've got two straight wheels in the back, so we will have to lead it this way to move it around. This is the modular unit that I want to use on all my future rolling cabinets. And the reason I want the wheels to retract is when I do that, I have control over the height and I can maintain a consistent counter height on all my cabinets, even though I'm rolling around the shop. So let me get this cast iron off the top and I'll show you how this base works and how we're going to put it together. Let's talk about how this works. I have a paddle over here and I have a paddle over here. They're connected with a rod underneath and I'll show you that in a minute with these two screws and this screw right here. And then I've got a hinge right here. When I push down on this, the wheel here and the two wheels here engage and lift the whole case up. So that's how it works. The real trick here is to get the tolerances and the dimensions right, and that's where all the effort has been. Let's turn this over, and I'll show you the underside. Here's the paddle, and here's the other paddle. This is the bar that's underneath, and as I pick up this bar, you can see how the action works. Now, the dimensional tolerances are such that these wheels engage below these feet by about one half inch, and that's what we want. Some changes that we're going to make. I'm going to take this strip of wood right here, and I'm going to replace it with real wood. And that's to give me a plank. I'll cut out a little bit for the wheel over here and over here. And that's to give me something more to put these feet in. I'll do the same thing over here, not worrying as much about that wheel right there. The same will be done up front and the same in the back, but I will have to cut away these areas here because as you can see, this bar gets in the way. I may take this bar and move him back a little bit, but I really don't want to because the distance between here and here gives me more umph in the lever. So I imagine we'll just cut the wood away a bit right there. This is the lever. We're going to change that up a little bit as well. It is several pieces of laminated wood and it hooks in here and that engages the wheels and when we press down on the back side that engages the feet. This is the mechanism that makes the whole thing work. One final thought. This is a modular unit. The dimensions may change a little bit depending upon the cabinet. This one is a little more narrow than most. However, I want to be able to build this unit, complete it, and then build the cabinet on top of it. Now, why is that, you ask? There are so many nuts and bolts that I need access to on both sides that I don't think that I could ever get a hand in underneath around the corner to assemble this thing after the fact if I had the whole cabinet to do it in. And I don't want to fight that battle. So we will build these slightly smaller than the overall cabinet and they will fit in up underneath. That's the mentality. So now that we understand where we're going, let's get some plywood out and let's start cutting up some of our pieces here. And while we do that, We'll take apart this unit and we'll change it up to its final configuration. I mean, there are still improvements to be made here. And this unit will stick around and be an example for a future. We'll start by cutting out the stock for the sides. 
The height is the same for all four pieces. We're going to start with the bottom, and this is the plywood piece that the feet, the T-nuts, are going to bite on. This is going to kind of encapsulate part of the bottom of the base. I have a stop set up here at 13 inches, and this will go across the bottom. We'll make the cut. I've taken the feet out over here to give you an idea of what we're getting ready to do. This is where this plank goes that we just finished cutting. This will surface right here will give me a lot more room for this T-nut to bite on than the edge of this over here. I'll feel much better about that. Additionally, it reinforces this corner, which is important because all this is screwed together. It's not glued, so a little bit of this reinforcement will help. Now, you're noticing right now we've got a cutaway right here. We'll do that on the bandsaw. I don't see that as a big deal. We've got the same thing going on over here with two cutaways over there. Now, I'm going to cut this back the three quarters of an inch for the plywood here. This section will stay the same height for now, and I will notch this out to accept this piece. So, since we're rebuilding this, I'm going to take this apart. I'm going to make these changes on the table saw and bandsaw. I'm also going to cut these perimeter pieces out of some spare plywood I have in the back room. I have a stop in place and it is attached to the fence. And the stop is placed to accommodate the thickness of the stiffener. This is where the stiffener is going to go so you can see the area that needs to be cut out. The fence is set to the thickness of the wood minus the kerf. This is a very simple cut once all the prep work has been put in place. A good miter gauge is a good miter gauge, whether it's on a table saw or a band saw or just about anything. Don't be afraid to use it. This is a perfect application for this tool. So this is one of the side pieces. And this right here is to clear the knuckle of the hinge. And I have this set up right now so that it does that measure on that side. We'll bump the fence back a little bit each time. We're not going to install the dado step. Now I need to do these two and this one, and that's all I need to do. Now, don't get it on the wrong side. This is the side that needs to be cut. Can you see the gears turning? I think I've made a mistake. What's wrong in this picture? Well, that dado's in the wrong place. Well, it's just one part of it, so I think we can get by with just reworking it. I'm not going to replace that piece. It's on the inside. Nobody will ever see it. This is some more of that plywood from the rolling storage, and I've got one square edge right here. So what I'm going to do, and I've also made a mark. This is my template right here. So I'll take him like this, make the mark there, and what I want to do is bring us right on up to the blade. Put that mark right on the edge right there. All right, that'll be good. This is not a square edge right here, but this is also square. So I'll put this on top, careful not to move the bottom piece, and we'll just do it by feel. This isn't that critical. As long as you're close, I think that will be fine. These are moving parts, and they're, they've got a little slop in them. Got 
got my pieces lined up like this and I need to get this situation in place. Now this is pretty good right now. And I want this placed so that this blade, it just comes down right there. That's going to be fine. So we'll take this off. In a situation like this, sometimes it's best to have a, a clamp down right here. And I think that's what I'm going to do. So I don't have to worry about it. I can focus not on holding this in place, but I can focus on this. Especially seeing as how I'm not going to get this cut entirely through. I've got some extra to go later. So let's go ahead and make this cut now and we'll figure out how to get the other side. This is not my favorite cut and that's why I wanted to make the most of it first. I've got this engaged now and all I can do really, I've got this little bit supporting it here, but mostly it's going to be downward pressure. Yeah, we managed to do okay. Well, this is the uh, one of the few pieces left to do some woodworking on. And this piece goes between the two paddles and it has to get thinner here to fit between them. So what I, uh, I've got here, I'm at the drill press with a Fostner bit. And I've got my stop set up right here. That's about where I wanted it on the other one. Now, this is sacrificial, so the, the bit will go through, but that's where it's supposed to stop. This is my piece. So I will line it up with a fingertip, and there we are. We'll clean this up on the bandsaw. It's time to start looking at the foot pedal. And I'm going to be making this out of three pieces. The original was out of five, and that's because I didn't have a board thick enough at the time to bridge this seven-eighths inch gap. Why seven-eighths? Because that is the thickness of my steel plus two washers. And that will get me my thickness on the inside right here. Now the inside, if you'll note, is cut away. And that is so when you put the piece of steel in here on the lever, it can pivot and it pivots inside the overall mechanism. The outside, a little bit larger. Now, this piece of wood right here is not wide enough to do anything but the center. I need this one to do the outside. So we need to mill up both of these. This is much thicker. I can't get this in. So we know that we've got some room to play with. This on the other hand, it's too thin. I'd need two pieces anyway. That's why I source this other piece of stock. So we're going to mill this down to 7 8 and get a couple edges on it that are good and clean. And we're going to mill this one down, part of it down, to a quarter. And we'll build two of these. We'll start with the quarter inch section, cutting the template out on the bandsaw. I've cut out two templates on the bandsaw and I have sanded them flush on the oscillating belt sander. And these are my templates and I have a hole drilled here. and. I know that it works because I tested it out with a piece of that iron square bar with a hole cut about a half inch in from the end. So I'm happy with these. I'm going to trace these out on some stock, do a rough cut on the bandsaw, and then we will do a final cleanup cut on the bandsaw after the glue has set and then take them to the oscillating belt sander to sand them to final dimension. Having spent all this time to get our pieces to conform to the size of the template, we might as well ensure that the holes we put in it 
are indexed correctly. We'll do that by putting three screws through the template into the baseboard. That way when we drill through, all the holes will line up. Note that I've got one of the pedals gluing up in the background. We've used this template to great effect, but we've finished with these panels. Our holes are in place. This particular one is the one with the straight casters, so it does not have the holes in the center. You can put the holes in both. It doesn't matter. It can work this way or this way. But now it's time to do the short sides. thing I want to point out, this template will work for a wider case. You line up the corners, and for this corner you cut this series of holes, for this corner you cut this series of holes, you line it up in the center, and then you can put your center swivel in. These lever items, they match up on the same side. So this can work, but when it comes time to cut the holes in the sides, you've got a problem. You can't really use that temple effectively because it is the spacing between these that make all the difference. Now that is captured in this piece. So what I do, and remember, this is the knuckle that was cut here. What I do is place it there in the center, roughly, eyeball it, because this panel is going with this panel, and it is the spacing between the two that's important, and that is locked in. So what we will do is we'll line it up, we'll take this straight edge, and we'll put it there against that dado and square it up. But the first thing I'll point out, this screw hole right here that was used to secure, secure these two, it does not go through. You don't want to be fighting that. Drill it out. And that way you won't have to work as hard to get them to seat. So, now that that's there, we'll take that. Sometimes it helps to have a little bit of a support there. I'll take my combination square rule, line it up straight, and bring him in tight. Now, I will eyeball it roughly, and you'll be surprised how close you'll get when you've only got a quarter inch play in both sides, and that's all you should have. Now he's in place. Put the pressure on. I mean, put the pressure on. What will happen a lot of times is this screw will actually lift up the panel. Hope they've got enough pressure that won't happen. That's good. That side's still good. If it gets out of line, you got to change it. All right, we're in place. Now, you might ask, if I moved them back and forth, I might have different spacing between these two. I didn't have to do that that time, this time. The only thing that you need to do is make sure you keep this panel with this side if you have a larger cabinet, and it'll work out fine. So I'm going to go to the drill press, drill these out, and we'll start the next step. Well, it's time to start to cut the holes for the hinges in the long face. There's only one of them. And we cut this center bracket here with another template that we've made and that's what I've got here and we're going we don't need to use this piece the one that actually we cut out for this particular set of wheel lifts for this we can use the template recall we couldn't use this template the last time because the wheel sp the hinge spacing the the size of the cabinet could change that's not going to be the case here I've got one set of hinges so I can use the template and I've got a screw hole in place already for it. We're going to be lining up with the top of this knuckle again. So I like to put a T-square right here. Again, center line's already marked. Line it up. Get him in place. And then rotate him up a little bit. Should be just by touch. That's good. Now, take your same square. Square it up. That'll serve you well. Now... I've only got space for one screw. I'm probably going to put a second screw in this template, but just not at the moment. Yeah, you see them lift up that way? Not really what I wanted. But at the end of the day, it is still square. 
and it's still tight. So I'm in good shape. So I don't think I need a second screw in there. This thing is pretty stout. I'll take this over to the drill press and we'll get this drilled out. Now there's a hole in the other side where the lever comes through and that's what I'm cutting right now. Um, and I put in four holes at the corner. We'll try to get it as close as we can. A jigsaw is not the best tool, but we'll do the best we can with it. These panels have been interchangeable for the most part. Now granted, I have holes drilled here for the swivel, but I also had holes drilled here for the straights. I did not drill the swivel holes on the other side, so it's obvious that I have one side versus another. And now it's going to be finalized because these two panels, they need a 45 degree angle cut in each side to accommodate the hinges. So we're going to cut this side over here and this side over here, and that's going to lock this in place. So it's off to the table saw. We've got this marked here and of course the other one marked on the other side so we know. I have a sacrificial fence here and my blade is just right up next to that. Now you need to be to this side of this blade because it may shoot out back there and when it does it's going to hurt. This is the bottom plate that goes on that reinforces the bottom and it's actually going to provide a lot of strength. And I have made a cutout here for to accommodate this rotating wheel. And note that I'm far enough over if this wheel were in this position, which would be about here, I still have enough room over here to clear on this side as I do on this side over here to clear over there. So keep in mind, you may want to set up a jig like this if your distance becomes a little longer or shorter to accommodate the same thing. Now, we're doing this on both sets, the prototype and the one that we're going to be using because I want to keep the prototype around. So we'll be cutting out another one of these. And for the straight wheels, I've already marked out what it's going to look like. So we'll get these cut out on the bandsaw. I'm starting to put the prototype back together again. I thought you might want to see how these work. There's definite clearance here, but these are the first two pieces. This is going to reinforce this box enormously. So I will take time and I'll drill these holes first, and then I'll follow back up with some 1 and 5 8 screws. I've reassembled the prototype because I want to test this foot pedal and it works. It works quite well, but it has a tendency to flip back and that's not what I want. So what I have done is I've taken a, put a spring right here that will put just a touch of pressure on the bottom of that steel lever and it works great now. Word of caution, when you put a little screw in here and the grain direction is running even with this foot rest right here, you can split this wood pre-drill that hole. Assembled and it is working just fine. So what do we got to do next? Are we finished? No. I want a piece of stock here and a piece of stock here so that I have something to screw the cabinet to. And I do not want it higher than this because that takes away from the overall space I've got on the cabinet. So we're going to recess this. We're going to trim off a full inch here we're going to notch this an inch over here on each side and that side as well. So we'll take this to the table saw and the band saw and get that done. I'll reassemble the whole thing again with the new stock in place and we will assess how that's going to work with the new unit. We need two strips, one for each unit. Well, we've got two units, so we'll cut four. We'll cut all four strips to length at the same time. Note the clamp in the background. That prevents any slipping during cutting. I've assembled the prototype and I'm calling it complete. I have my sections here in place so that we can screw our cabinet down on top of it. I have included two holes here that allow for adjustments to these leveling, leveling bolts that control how the panels move up and down. I have a notch here to accommodate for this bolt right here, for the lever bolt. 
Finally, we are going to need to make some accommodation in the main cabinet for this toe paddle. And in the closed position, that's fine. But when it's up and on the feet, it's going to be tall. So a hole in there or something, we're going to have to look at this pretty closely to see how the foot needs to go in under the toe rest to press down on this. I think it's going to be okay, but we won't know until we get some sort of cabinetry on top of this. I'm calling this good. We're going to now assemble the unit that's going into the router table. I've assembled the box and probably one of the first things that you're going to notice is it's a bit tighter than the other one and it should be. This one's been assembled I don't know how many times. This has been a lengthy process. So what I have done, I have put quite a few more screws in it on either side. It is a lot stouter. Also, there are no screws on these corners anymore. Don't need to be. The tops and bottoms do all the work for me. So the next step in this process is that I am actually going to countersink all these and use a slightly smaller bolt. So we're off to the drill press. All this will be disassembled and I'm going to countersink all these holes. I think you can see now if I had tried to assemble this thing with all the pieces in place, it would have been impossible to get these nuts and bolts. I am using a one inch, one inch thread plus the, plus the head of the nut as the, uh, as the new, new screw and it is proving to be quite good. The, uh, as a matter of fact, it's better than the other one. Once I get the nut on, there is just barely a little bit outstanding. Plus, when you countersink these holes, give yourself just a little bit of extra so that the bolt is a bit proud. When you wrench that thing down, it'll be flush. There's a lot of bolts, but the assembly process is going pretty quickly. So the next step involved in this is actually start cutting steel. And we've got our pieces in place so we can take some measurements. Let's head over to the friction saw and we'll cut those pieces and we'll start to drill some holes at the drill press to accommodate our paddles. I've got 10 inches marked on my cross piece, so I'll go ahead and make the cut here. I'm set up over here at the drill press and I have taken the pieces off the prototype and I've transferred the marks over. That's the first step. Second step is to get your quarter inch drill bit into the drill press. I'm using quarter inch on all my nuts and bolts, so that's what I'm going to stick with here. I have also taken a piece of scrap and I put it on here. That is to catch the filings and the oil. Oil. If you will take a drop of oil and put it on the spot that you're drilling, you will find that it makes a lot of difference in how smooth it cuts and how much longer your bits will last. Finally, drill press has been taken down to its lowest possible speed and that also is a requirement when you're cutting steel. Now, we're going to bevel this bit out. A little bit more oil there. We're trying to duplicate that hole right there. I'm down to the feet and we're going to be using some old feet that I have reclaimed from an old demo project from a number of years back. These are 5 16 and I've got a, a T-nut accordingly. Now what I want to do with this T-nut is I want to go ahead and recess it so that it's just at the surface and then I'll drill out the barrel after that. Uh, and finally, once I get it in place, I will actually drill a very small hole for each of these T-nuts, the little prongs, and that will that go a long way for making this go in lickety-split. Now, what I have done here 
is I've taken a piece of plywood on both sides to mark the edge and then offset the appropriate amount. And I've got a jig here that helps me keep it in place and it's just a simple matter of grilling. That's about all you need for the first hole and that is just shy. That's exactly what I want. We're going to take our T-nut with the foot installed and put it in place and we'll give it a tap. That tap will help mark the three prongs that the T-nut uses to maintain its position. After that we're going to drill it out and actually that drilling out will help those prongs seat more firmly into the wood. It'll be a longer duration fit. Much like drilling out a screw, you can get up to 80% more holding power if you drill it out to the correct diameter. Well, here they are. This was the original we started with, and we've made a number of improvements, anywhere from cutting out notches, to trimming it down to a narrower profile, and adding reinforcement. And we took those learnings and we brought it over to the one that I'm going to be using for the router table. And some more additional improvements as well. I use smaller bolts on the paddles so I don't have to worry about drilling these holes for clearance. I have recessed all the bolts so when we put our panels all the way down on the sides we don't have to cut holes for them. That'll be a, a, a lifesaver. I like the foot pedal. It works great. Push down on it and we're rolling. Push up and we're solid on the floor. So I think this has been a good project and you can apply this to any cabinet that you have. It doesn't have to be a router table. It can be a grinder station, a sharpening station. It can be a sanding station. You can take this concept and go to a full size workbench or assembly table. All you need are some of the templates and I've saved those. So we're going to step off on the next episode and start working on the cabinetry for the router table. So I hope to see you there in Aerobe's workshop. Mm -hmm.